Hello, and welcome back to Lost in Citations, our regular podcast where we speak to the producers of interesting content and see if we can learn a little bit more about their background. Joining us today is Dr. Joseph Vitter, who is an associate professor in the Faculty of Languages and Cultures at Kyushu University. Very nice to speak to you today, Joe. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. The paper we're going to be speaking about is the Flipped Classroom in Second Language Learning, a meta-analysis that was published in 2020. So it's something very, very recent. The title includes the phrase Flipped Classroom which for second language teaching uh, oriented people. Uh, it's something that they would know, but for people who are not familiar with it, what is a flipped classroom? I mean, reading your paper, it includes several possible definitions and considers the use or not of technology. So which definition do you subscribe to? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And <clears throat> the answer to that question is that I would tend to embrace the vagueness. Um, a flipped classroom at its, at its most basic form sees content and homework flip. So the content moves to the homework and it is, it is done before class by the students. And then the class time is, is then used to really meaningfully interact and to engage with the content that's been learned before. And I think we need to embrace that vagueness because every classroom is different and every classroom is going to have different resources and different goals. But at its core, flipped classes reserve class time for higher order engagement with content that has been learned before during the homework time. Now, in second language, I think there is a natural connection or link between between technology and flipped and 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 flipped classrooms for example in our meta-analysis every study we included used technology but it's important to realize that at the theory level jeffrey maring who is probably yeah i'll go ahead and say it and he's a personal contact so i have bias uh, he's probably the person who introduced the concept to EFL at least, and he published a uh, chapter book in 2018, and he published on it in 2016. So given his prominence, if he says that technology is not a vital part of what flipped learning is, then I think we need to pay attention to that. Um, but with that said, to, to give a working definition, Content precedes class in terms of homework. Class time is then used to meaningfully interact with, with the content and in a way where the students have agency to see how the class time is used. I would be remiss to say that Bloom's taxonomy doesn't fit into this because it does. And the um, lower order skills are done at home and the, and the higher order skills are done in the classroom. And that's why we, we often hear higher order thinking and Bloom's taxonomy when it comes to flipped classes. So talking about higher order and lower order, are we basically saying that it doesn't matter which uh, field we're talking about, the skills that can be dealt with by the students on their own, things that were already acquired should yeah. be done outside the classroom. And then the things that do require classroom attention, peer-to-peer -peer -peer practice, teacher-fronted instruction, those are the things that are dealt with in class time. Exactly. That's exactly right. And, and that's why in, in a paper, which I published a while ago, um, I, I did mention, uh, not the paper that we're talking about, but there is some connection between flipped learning and some of the task-based approaches. Uh, so, for example, um, test, teach, test, sometimes called the task, teach, task, sees the teacher react in the classroom to what mm. the students are doing. And that's basically what flipped classes should be about, that, mm -hmm. the, that the students come to class, they begin interacting around the content, with the content, and then the teacher has an opportunity to kind of push and pull the students the way that they need to go or the way that they want to go. Um, so really what flipped classes are about and, and what our meta-analysis kind of found when we looked at the effect sizes is that when the content lends itself to meaningful engagement, when students have to learn processes, when students can meaningfully interact with the second language, hmm. it is a powerful way to um, teach. But 
At the same time, and again, vagueness is kind of the theme I want to focus on. The editor of Call Journal, um, very, very well known, and he published a editorial where he complained about the types of submissions that the journal was getting. And he complained about lots of stuff. It was, it was kind of funny to actually <laughs> read, but he mentioned Flipped explicitly. And he said, stop submitting this as this new idea. Teachers have known this for 40 or 50 <laughs> years. So flipped teaching could basically be a reconceptual, a reconceptualization of what, of what's, of what good teachers already do. A good teacher gives the students a chance to have agency in the classroom. A good teacher leverages homework in the class so that there are connections built between what they've done and what they will do. So, yeah, I mean, to, I think it's very important that people who read our paper and want to know more about flipped know that one, they probably all might already be doing flipped classes in another way, but two, <clears throat> they really get to decide what flipped is going to be in their classroom. There's no recipe as to what the perfect flipped class is. Yeah, this is something that came up in an interview that I did very recently with Robert Murphy, talking about co-creation of classroom activities, co-creation of knowledge. And I think it does relate very closely to the confidence of the teacher. So would you agree that the more experienced the teacher, the more understanding of different methodologies they have, the more likely they are, even if they don't call it a flipped classroom, to use this kind of methodology in their teaching? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I think that the more seasoned the teacher is, the more invested the teacher is in developing their professional kind of skill set, um, the more they're going to be using flipped classes or the principles of flipped classrooms in their work. With that said, though, let's also be clear that there is an opportunity for new teachers who may not be set in their ways, who might have, who might be coming out of good master's programs to, I mean, we might go into their classrooms and see really innovative flipped work as well. Um, and just to give um, one example, uh, one of my colleagues or ex-colleagues at Riccio University, she published a paper where she talked about how COVID forced her into, not forced, but gave her the opportunity to implement flipped with online teaching. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And well, and, and, and what's interesting about that is that flipped technically should be a mix from a physical classroom and technology because it's a hybrid kind of approach mm -hmm. or blended approach, but a live zoom meeting, we could consider it a virtual classroom, if you will. The point is though, um, this person, uh, She's only been a teacher for a few years, but she came out of a good master's program. She reads widely and she just immediately knew, oh, well, flipped is something that would work in this kind of setting and would let me kind of do what I need to do. And she then went for it. She might have been able to do that easier than, let's say, a teacher of 25 years who would have had to revamp everything that they've prepared. So I, I think we need to realize that it's not going to be a universal axiom that older teachers flip better or newer teachers flip better. I, I, I think it's a mindset. I think it may be related to exactly as you say, a mindset, but the way that people structure their courses, structure their lessons. I mean, in the past, I was a coordinator of language courses that were prescribed by mm. the university I was at at the time. And so there'd be like 10, 11, 12, oftentimes uh, newly minted MA holding teachers yeah would come in with ideas and things that they'd learned in their programs and i'd kind of have to my job would be kind of like okay just slow down slow down slow down yeah but i always found that the teachers who were process oriented that every minute of the classroom was was an event that they tried to utilize for the betterment of their students and their courses versus product oriented teachers who are like focused on the test or focused on the output right. uh, i felt that that kind of process oriented teaching style suited language teaching and also probably suits a flipped classroom because it's all about agency it's all about That's how much of the yeah. uh how much of the authority in the class you give up to the students and i think the more confident teacher whether more experienced or just confident in their own abilities is more likely to give agency over to the students than the person who's got a product they've got a thing that they need to get yeah, to yeah. and uh, i think that they may be 
less open to this idea. So you brought up the idea of, you mentioned the connection of the COVID lockdowns and changes in classroom that were forced on teachers. Do you think that the experience of online classes will change attitudes of teachers and maybe they'd be more open to flipped classrooms in the future? I do think so. I think that <clears throat> one of the things that COVID has forced in the Japanese context, and I think in others, is the economic use of um, class time. So, you know, Zoom has its limitations because if you don't pay for the subscription, you would be capped at 40 minutes, although they've changed that. We need to respect students' data usage and things such as that. So Flipped really lends itself to these types of situations where you you kind of have to put stuff on the student end to be done before you see the teacher and let's not say agency agency is part of it but also i think economic principles to say that we need to use our time efficiently and covid forces that so and and when and when you do that flipped is something that becomes a very valuable, a very valuable tool, but we need to realize, and this is something that the meta analysis kind of showed. And I won't subject your listeners to Q test values <laughs> and Cohen's D and stuff like that. I'll speak in general terms. You, you, but, you only subjected me to it in reading the paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what we found is that you needed a certain proficiency level for flip to work and flipped was more effective for process skills and for underlying competencies so if you have a vocabulary class where the learners are a1 or a2 using flipped is a bad idea mm -hmm. but if you have a writing class and a1 a2 excuse me is the sefer and that would be like the beginning stages but if you have a writing class of b1 learners who are learning basic paragraphs and you need to teach them online. Flipped is a very powerful tool. Mm. And our meta-analysis bore that out empirically that, yes, it works and, and it works very well. I do think, though, that one of, the, one of the issues with Flipped is that we need to be careful that we don't, that we don't get overwhelmed by the tyranny of buzzwords, right? And, that, and, that, and just saying that you're flipping it just, just to flip it could be a problem as well because there are certain things that flip does that you need to be aware of because that's the point of it right mm -hmm. so if you have students who um like so let's say when we teach essay writing in japanese mm -hmm. and not not japanese two japanese students who are learning english one of the major issues you find are things like formatting register cohesion mm -hmm. and flipped is really good for that because you can make your model you you can make your video you you uh, then assess them as they come into class and then you teach based off of that and you let them kind of tell you what they need help with but if you don't understand or it's not but if a teacher doesn't understand that this is what flipped is for and if they put content into the flipped that isn't going to really guide the lesson or isn't really needed then you're kind of wasting their time right mm -hmm. so and i think that's the danger of flipped is that the teacher has to be very very aware of wh why they're flipping and what will be the content when it's flipped because if a teacher were, were was teaching essays for the first time and then made the content too too easy you know this is a sentence and this is a paragraph then the point of the flip is gone Right. right, because they have to have content which is somewhat challenging and very related to what the outcomes and teaching goals are. And and if and if the teacher doesn't really know what's going on, they probably would be better with more of a traditional task-based approach or something where most of the new stuff was done in class because it's new to the teacher as well. And it's kind of as you said, this is where experienced teachers are more maybe more apt to flip. The, the key word that while you were speaking that I wrote down here is, is time. You right. need to know where time is best spent and how exactly. it is best spent. So if, again, let, let's use the example of writing, giving students a model 
and saying, make your essay look like this. And when it comes to formatting, when it comes to content, when it comes to structure, then that is the thing that takes time. And if you've only got 90 minutes in a, in a class, then that might take the student the entire time exactly. to yeah. reformat, restructure their contents to make it look like the essay. But they're not receiving any guidance from a teacher that they couldn't just receive from a document right on you know online or or something that was uh, presented through a, a short video so i think it's the as you say the economic use of class time that's where the value of a flipped classroom comes in not necessarily that it's novel or not necessarily that it's using technology but that it effectively uses the time of the students and the teacher to address things that need to be organized in in a, in a course structure so let's move on and uh, let's ask something personal uh what have been your experiences of using a flipped classroom or what elements of flipped classroom have you been using in our recent sure. switch to online learning that's a good question i mean and as i was preparing for this interview i kind of reflected on what i call a dumb flip so in <laughs> in um 2012 and 2013 i guess 2011 as well i was a i was a teacher at a at a university in seoul and i was really interested in vocabulary and i would have my students read new york times articles in a intensive reading manner mm -hmm. And then they would have to prepare vocabulary items. I mean, I won't get into the details, but they'd have to bring it to class. And then they would present their new vocabulary items in class and talk about why they found it interesting and how they could use it. And that might not be flipped per se, but in a way it is because the content, the New York Times articles were processed before class. Right. And then when they came into class, there was this, communal kind of communicative interaction around what they had done now i'm not saying that's flipped but when i was thinking about the vagueness of flipped and how teachers might be flipping already i thought that was a really interesting point that you know eight year nine years later i would publish a meta-analysis on on a process that i in a way had already been doing hmm. um with that said i did use flipped last year um, this year, because I'm teaching um, receptive classes, I haven't had the opportunity to really flip as much as I want to. But last year, teaching academic report writing, just as I said, I would make videos or I, I would make notes based on the content that we would do in, in a class. I would do kind of a TTT type of thing where they would have an opportunity at the beginning of class to show me what, what they understood about the content and what they did not. Then I would have a 10 to 15 minute lecture, mini lesson based off of what I thought they needed. And then they'd go into a longer productive task or mm -hmm. project time to then work on what they were doing. And, and specifically, the thing I found was that the students really, as you say, benefit from being presented with a model. And then you highlight what is important in the model. Mm. And the thing which is really interesting is that what you think they're going to be good at, they're not. And what you think they, and what you think you might, or I found the thing that I thought um, they would have trouble with, they actually did quite um, well with. Mm. So I thought that B2 learners, which is what they were, which is a high intermediate, they could study in a UK master's course. They had real trouble using pronouns to govern co cohesion within the paragraph. Mm -hmm. And I was really surprised by that. But then, it, but then if you think about it, they've been taught English communicatively because this is what we do now. Mm -hmm. So when you get to a mechanical issue such as that to say, no, you use pronouns this way so that the reader knows the, the, the ideas in the paragraph connect. It's interesting that they needed me to kind of hold their hand through that while they almost naturally chose the right lexical items to convey a academic tone, mm. which again might speak to how vocabulary has now is now at the forefront of how we teach and probably how they studied in high school because most of them went to international schools. So, so yeah, just to answer the question shortly, I um, used it in academic writing when I was teaching over Zoom. That's an interesting point that you bring up pronouns because 
recently I've been working with both my sons uh, towards the Aiken test, the, the right, test right, of right. proficiency that's used in Japan. And pronouns are basically, having looked at the textbook that we're using and also my experience of using textbooks over the last, you know, 20 years or so, yeah. it's, uh, pronouns is something that I just think is kind of taken for granted that mm. people will know that there is because it's it's basically taught through a b conversations one person asks a question someone right, gives right. an answer they give some follow-up or something like that but when it comes to writing the kind of structural specificity that pronouns bring you is not something that's kind of covered in the in the kind of exam prep that these textbooks yeah. have so I, I think pronouns is, is one thing and interesting to to bring up without um, bringing the dis yeah, without bringing the discussion too far off sure, the sure, flip sure. i think it's also a artifact of the fact that proficiency scales and thereby testing objectives mm -hmm. tend to take a western outlook mm. and indo-european languages tend to use pronouns the same, not exactly the same way but german is my second language mm -hmm. My pronoun use in English is quite similar, and the differences are few enough that they're learning points. I can I can I can anchor things on. I use it this way in English. I use it this way in German. Mm -hmm. Japanese is very very different, you know, in, in in terms of how they use pronouns, in terms of how they select pronouns. So I think it is one of those things where um where uh, course books and curricula would overlook it because it's assuming a stance from international um, uh, proficiency scales that don't respect the exact, not, I think respect is the wrong word, are not cognizant of mm -hmm. the, the uh, particular nature of Japanese pronoun use. It's, it's Japanese and other high context languages. I mean, right, right. an entire sentence of meaning that would be required from English or German can be conveyed by a single word in Japanese exactly, by yeah. dropping out pronouns and, and other things when it's in, used in context with other content. So uh, that is something that does need, you know, focused study in order to, to build that cohesion. Uh, right. As you say, I mean, this is something that I spoke about with Dr. James D'Angelo when we were talking about world Englishes and the work of Galloway and Rose and, and using that listening journals and basically giving students topics and getting them to do the preliminary research, me not directing the research, but giving them a topic saying, this is what we're going to talk about in class. I'm going to choose my sources. You find your sources and bring yeah. the research together. And so, so when we talk about, you know, putting the responsibility on the students to bring, as you say, the, the, the materials and, and the contents to class, and then we can actually use class time on skills. I think that that's something that flip classrooms really gives us the opportunity to do. Totally agree. So you mentioned that in your paper on flipped classrooms, focus on second language acquisition. Yes. And that the higher the proficiency of the students, the more significant the effect of using a flipped classroom. Basically, yeah. yeah. So, so would, you, would you say that for lower level, beginner, low intermediate classes, <clears throat> it's not something that a teacher should use or should use in a very focused controlled way so one of the things so to answer your that that question i can get into a, a, a little bit of detail mm -hmm. um we anchored our proficiency leveling at b1 so b1 was was intermediate and then below b1 was beginner right and there are things that that um you can do for that you can look at how they describe the proficiency and many papers were coded as na that we couldn't make a judgment hmm. um but for example if they put a toic score of or like like uh, like a mean toic score of 350 well then that's a2 and then that would be at the lower level so that would be i would say like b1 and higher is optimal for a uh, flipped for the lower levels i would not recommend flipped learning and I, and i would even be wary of even task-based approaches although you need to do them sometimes of course we have to take a step back and think about, well, over the last 10 years, functional linguistic theory has won out the debate as to how we conceive language at the second learning, a uh, second language learning acquisition, whatever level you, um, you want to say. And one of the hallmarks of this theory is that competency underpins skill. 
So when we use language, we use our vocabulary competency, we use our grammatical competency, we use our pronunciation competency, we use all these competencies. And for beginners, developing these competencies are the most important thing. So you could look at empirical papers that show you that vocabulary is first, grammar is second when it comes to IELTS listening or when it comes to writing or speaking. So for A1, A2 learners, there is, of, of course, we need to engage them. Of course, we can't just make them do vocabulary flashcards five hours a week because they'll hate English. <laughs> but there is, this, there is this imperative to say, okay, you need the building blocks now. Um, for example, I've lived in Japan long enough now where my Japanese needs to get better. Learning kanji is what I'm doing now, right? I mean, it'd be nice to have a, it'd be nice to have a discussion, but until I know the first 500 characters, what's the point, right? And I think that's where flipped kind of comes in as well. And I think that's where teachers really do need to take a look at the types of classes that they're teaching or the types of students that they have, because as much as we want to engage them, as much as we want to give them agency, there is a cart and horse type of deal where if a learner doesn't have the competencies to be an independent user, they're not ready for something such as flipped. And I think you would find people who would disagree with me, I, I, I would say, but our meta-analysis is what it is and the data is what it is and shows that a certain level of, profici of proficiency does worse than others. So that's what I'm basing my, my um, viewpoint on. No, it is something that came out through reading the paper that you're not taking a stance on whether flip classrooms are necessarily better than other forms of methodology. It's giving the data, which is, as you say, what it is yeah. and suggesting ways for people to address it. And on this topic, because I know that different universities are different <laughs> ways of approaching language teaching sometimes for example in our situation we have uh, an overarching curriculum but we mm. can choose our own textbooks we can choose the way that we teach we can you know if you wanted to implement a flipped classroom and i wanted to keep it a more traditional teacher fronted we'd be perfectly fine doing that but other universities want to have a top down you know one size fits all and i want to just come back to your phrase that the tyranny of buzzwords that a new director might come in they might think that flip classroom is the new cool thing to do what would be your advice to a teacher in that situation who knows that the students coming in might be a2 at best and you know what kind of way could they implement a uh, kind of a limited flipped sure. or something for lower proficiency that would address what was being required by the institution, but the, stu but the teacher knowing that the students aren't ready for it? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I think that in that situation, if a teacher had a, had a proverbial gun to her head and had <laughs> to flip, I would keep the content outside the classroom easy. Mm -hmm. Um, so that when the students came to class, they felt good about what they had done. They felt that the, that the class would be okay for them. And then you could slowly ratchet things up within the classroom. I think that if you look at, maybe not, because with a meta-analysis, uh, the real focus is on effect size. Of course, you look at study quality. Of course, you look at how they did flip. But really, effect sizes and moderators were what we were interested in. Um, but having read the good flip papers, you did see that students were challenged, uh, you know, th that, that, that the flip was meant to push them so that when they came in the class, there was, there were opportunities for the teacher to expand and to challenge the students. I don't think you would do that with low level learners. Um, I mean, so, um, one of the things that was interesting is, um, one of the papers that had almost a minimal effect size, and uh, it was it was conducted in I think I think America, but the target language was Japanese, and they flipped kanji, mm. and they basically got the characters outside of class, and then they would practice the characters when they came into class. For um, listeners who aren't familiar what with what kanji is. Kanji are Chinese characters used in Japanese writing. And you could, using that, that example, 
you could see where and the and beginners were a part of the sample you could see where that's not ideal where you probably if you were to flip that might not even do the kanji you might do something that's related to it or you might you might even do it in english to tell the story of what the characters are and what they mean um but they just presented the kanji mm -hmm. and the and the effect sizes were quite bad um not and let's be clear here because i i don't want to go on record and saying that a big effect size is is good um we found publication bias in our um, meta-analysis which is a fancy way of saying that the field overall selected publication bias has a negative meaning well, well, let me take a step back and 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 our uh, and our p curve was was good so there wasn't p hacking mm -hmm. but there was bias towards higher effect sizes and when we corrected it the effect size went down 33%. So what that means is that there's not P hacking because our P curve was good, but there was a tendency to select and publish studies that had very high effect sizes. And that's a problem because then that means that the field is getting information that might be inflated. When I mentioned that study with the low effect size, that's good. <laughs> that's something that, that I think early researchers should know that if you have a low effect size, publish it. That's great. Um, so I'm not saying that the study was bad. It was not. But the treatment of how they presented kanji probably was less than optimal for a beginner student. That's my point. Uh, and also just to give a little detail on uh, people who are not uh, not quant people, and I'm certainly yeah. not, uh, yeah. p-hacking is the idea that, that you collect a lot of data you find what the p-value is and then you recreate the study post hoc to make it look like that's what you were looking for yeah in the it, first place would let's not get too too technical but hacking <laughs> is when you massage the data to get a significant result or to get a result that you think is interesting and our p-curve was in a way and the inferential test based on it showed that 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 wasn't a concern um visually things might have been a bit unclear towards one of the tails but for the most part yeah it, it was okay but what we did find was that the um that when we corrected for missing for missing effect sizes using a funnel plot and people who are interested can um, read the paper that the effect size that we found that was close to one mm. moved to 0.58 which is in line with what other meta-analyses have found when they focused on quality papers right. i mean for teachers and for the casual listener what that means i mean taking a step back and looking at the forest is that classroom-based research on flipped has in the aggregate been too interested in studies that presented very high effect sizes. And the problem with that, of course, is that it may lend to the conclusion that, oh, flipped is wonderful and flipped is going to save everything. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the effect sizes through another way and when, and when you correct for that inflation, then it's much more reasonable and i think what we would kind of expect to say yeah flipped is interesting flipped works it works really well in certain circumstances but by no means is it a silver bullet um and interestingly in another meta-analysis well it wasn't technically a meta-analysis but one that was published this year we found the same thing where when we deleted effect sizes that didn't make any sense that kind of answered stupid questions like one group did did absolutely nothing and one group learned the vocabulary words well yeah the effect size is going to be huge but that doesn't answer anything meaningful um that we also found that the effect went down so in some i guess just to bring it back because i think we're having a teacher oriented discussion which is great don't read a paper with a very large effect or you know something that seems really overwhelming and think that there's a eureka moment that for every study that's like that there's probably two or three that found nothing that haven't been published mm. and we need to kind of interpret that as teachers with a 
with a cautious kind of skepticism, if you will. Yeah, I mean, you use the word interesting to talk about, you know, various approaches to flip teaching. And I think that maybe interesting is kind of code for publishable. And this is where publication bias kind of comes in. And so to, to you bring that up in your paper that effect sizes that are large or positive results from a study are more likely to be published than ones that had low effect sizes or negative effects. And so right. you get this kind of inflation of a certain way of uh, teaching. I mean, we've seen this in the past with, with, with other methodologies. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I worked my way through conversation uh, a conversation school in Japan that was just focused on PPP, so like presentation practice performance, and that this was something that was introduced in the 70s and, you know, worked through in the 80s and just basically became a basic methodology, but was adopted by the language school I was working at as the one size fits all methodology. And I think that yeah. that's kind of something that we, we should avoid as both language Absolutely. researchers and, and, and language teachers. But let's let's talk about the, the process of publishing because this paper was uh, a co-authored between yourself and uh, Dr. Ali Al-Hori. Let's, let's talk about the, the, the process of producing a paper like this. Sure. Um, what is your process for, for paired writing or team writing? Do you, do you have oh. a certain skill set that you bring? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. So Ali and I go way back. Um, so it's, you mentioned Robert Murphy. Hmm. Uh, Ro Robert Murphy and I came into contact because I was a representative for Korea TESOL. Mm. And I became a program chair for one of their conferences and we invited Rob over and I was his handler for lack of a better term where I met him at the airport, went on the bus and we got to know each other. And Rob is very friendly. He's a great guy. And in 2016, we were, you know, firmly established as contacts. And I was an associate editor for Tesla International um, Journal and we were... I'm no longer involved with them, but we were on the cusp of getting indexed into Scopus and we started to get some pretty serious papers. So I got a paper that did a bunch of different factor analysis processes and something looked a bit off. So I went to Rob and I said, do you know anyone who could help me? And, I'll, and he um, recommended Ali and he gave a great review. And he was finishing his PhD at Nottingham and I was in kind of the thesis swamp in my own doctorate. And we just began talking. And then that led us to do our first big, big project where we analyzed 150 papers and made some determinations about, about quantitative quality within the field. And then that paper led to another smaller paper. And then towards the, in the summer of 2018, he approached me and said, I have this idea about flipped classrooms. Do you want to do another project? And I said, yes. And then, you know, as things go, you get busy, you kind of, but then finally in the spring of 2019, we began to dive in. The process really is a collaborative effort where we would check in on my progress, building the, the, um, the uh, report pool. He then did the gray literature um, search. And then in the summer of 2019, we began coding. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, is a back and forth uh, because you, um, you, you, you need to set up the scheme and then you do the reliability checks. And then we started writing in the, I guess, the late fall of 2019. And then that's where the process becomes, you kind of become each other's um, editors. I wrote some sections, he wrote others. Then we check each other's work. We um, argue over sentences and phrasing, of course. Um, but then towards the end of it, because I've now done five papers with him, you really get a very nice text where the negotiations and the debates result in a finalized product that I think represents various perspectives very well. Mm. And the thing that I like about working with Ali is that he brings a perspective to my writing, which is quite good in that he was trained as a psychologist. Mm -hmm. So I approach things from a teacher researcher 
point of view. So when we negotiate text and when we and when we bring things up, there's things I can see which he can't, and there's many many things he can see which I can't. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at our discussion, there really was some really good details to pay Ali a compliment in terms of asking the next generation questions that are pretty well entrenched in what psychology and language learning is trying to do. Mm -hmm. And if I had written this paper by, by myself, I wouldn't have been able to kind of do that. Mm -hmm. um, where my contributions would, would have been in line of a focus on proficiency, clarifying the suffering, the competency issues and what we do. Um, so yeah, no, Ali and I have done now five papers and we're working on a, another project. He's a mm -hmm. very good partner. And, 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 and I will say that, this paper, even though I'm first author, does reflect our partnership. This by no means was me alone. I mean, Ali and I always partner on the papers we do. So yeah, it was good. Yeah, on the point of first author, that's something that sometimes comes up, but I've been very lucky. I mean, the person that I co-author with most is uh, our colleague, Aaron Hart. Right, I, right. Think, I think five papers is probably what we've published up to this point together. And we have a process where I'm a I'm someone who just needs to sit down in front of a keyboard and type and yeah. start going and just produce as much content as possible. And then I edit it down and then see what he thinks about it. And he's, he's a very good editor. Yeah, and yeah. He, he also adds more flavor than I do, because although my character is something that wants to be, you know, flavorful and sometimes a little bit spicy when it comes to giving academic presentations, when I write, I'm quite I'll accept quite anodyne and right, right. he does add a little bit more flavor to it. I'm also, we've, I've published one and we're publishing another with my co-author of, uh, this podcast, uh, Jonathan, and he's kind of the same way. He'll be like, right, right, he, right. he will, uh, improve my prose, uh, and make it a little bit more readable. So it, it's, it's good when you have that back and forth with someone that you trust, that exactly. they, they feel really open to give you feedback and it just makes the whole process better. Yeah, I think the thing that, yeah, I think Ali and I have a similar um, dynamic. Um, also, Phil Hiver and I work when Ali was involved as well, and it was similar. But I think the thing that Ali and I have, which makes our projects unique, Ali's PhD supervisor was Zoltan Dornier. Mm -hmm. um, and Ali is one of those guys who I think because because he's a non-native speaker, he didn't have the interference of his first language, hmm. you know, parents. So his academic writing is quite clear and quite, quite straightforward. He's hmm. very, very good. And you talk about making things easier on the um, reader. Sometimes I'm too verbose because my, because my native speaker fluency gets the better of me. And I always very good at getting things right to the point. Mm. And, and that's where I really enjoy working with him because mm. the text that we finalize is a result of that creative tension in terms of my wanting to over explain and maybe put lots of details and then Ali wanting to be parsimonious. And we have a very good dynamic that way. I mean, him and Phil are definitely a, a, a um, pleasure to uh, uh, publish with. And I've been fortunate to do the number of papers I have with him. So it's interesting that you bring up uh, supervisors and, and helping because before I started my PhD, my background was in English literature, Christian philosophy and law. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of inspired to write, as you say, in a, in a more verbose, but perhaps more flowery way and right, right, my right. supervisor used to like point to paragraphs in my thesis and go what did you want to say here and then i just yeah, say yeah. it in a sentence and she would go just say that yeah and yeah. it um <laughs> i think it kind of it it restricted my my literary instincts and made me more yeah. focused on the things that i should be saying not the things that maybe i i want that or how i wanted to say it but I think that the process of collaborative writing really does allow each person's melded voice with the person they've chosen to work with become a little bit more interesting to the reader because the person who's reading it, your co-author is reading it as a reader right? and giving you feedback as to how people are going to uh, receive it and then hopefully making the paper a little bit more enjoyable for the person that has to digest it. 
Yeah, I think that's an interesting point because co-authored papers, especially in Japan and Korea, which are the areas I know as, as an academic best, are not given, are not celebrated as much as they should be, I think. And I think mm -hmm. really, especially now a days where the expectations on published papers are as high as they are, mm -hmm. um, just speaking from a quantitative perspective, what's expected now versus five, 10 years ago vastly different, vastly more intense. I'm not sure if single authored papers can really do that. So just to give a very quick example, single site studies are not acceptable anymore. I mean, big names get away with it. There was one paper, I, I won't say who, but they said 80 Japanese university students, it was clear it was from one university, just the way they described it. Um, but really 90% of us can't publish quantitative papers next year if we don't have at least two sites. Mm -hmm. And if somebody's going to let you collect data at their site and go through that trouble, they deserve to be a co-author. Right. Um, but then you also think about research synthesis, which is what I've been involved in and will continue to be involved in, I think. Um, I have two, well, one paper that's published, one paper that 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 I think will be hopefully we're in our second rewrite and Chris Nicklin and I, and then the second one is with um, us two and then Stuart McLean, we couldn't do the work by ourselves. So when you select, I, there was 82 and then 110 papers, according to selection cri criteria, you can't do that by yourself. Somebody has to check you. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to build it with you. Somebody has to then code the. I mean, so really, I think that, and then we haven't even begun talking about how if the text reflects two or more people's ideas, it's going to inherently be better. It's going to be more streamlined. It's going to be more representative of a diverse range of views. So I really do hope that the field gets away from single author papers, because I don't really think, especially in quantitative work, right. I really don't think it's appropriate at this uh, stage. That's a really good point. And I, I, I would agree with you on the idea that multiple authored papers, I think, really do provide that perspective. So even though when you're reading it, it seems like it's a single voice, the, the, the texture, the quality mm. of it is oftentimes much better than single authored I think that's a really good point to to finish on. So thank you very much for your time today, Joe. The paper that My we pleasure. have been speaking about is The Flipped Classroom in Second Language Learning, a meta-analysis. Thank you again for your time, and I wish you all the best of luck with your future papers, and I hope we get the chance to speak again. Me too. It's been fun. Take care, Chris. Bye. Thank you. Lost in Citations is an audio journal that invites you to contribute your own interviews. If there's someone whose work you cite regularly and you'd like to hear more from them, then please feel free to arrange your own interview and submit it for consideration. For more information, go to lostincitations.com where you'll find our guide for contributors. What we ask is you submit a five minute audio sample before the interview so that we can help you with any audio quality issues. Then you can go ahead and record 45 minutes to an hour and submit it at lostincitations at gmail.com. If you'd like to support the show, we have Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter pages. Finally, a very helpful thing you can do is, if you like the work we're doing, recommend it to a friend. Thank you very much.